actually I'm going to pay attention to vacation to it. Oh. Uh, the session, which is the title of which is Water Crisis, is water diplomacy up to the challenge, which in itself is a challenging question. In order to, to get the ball rolling, I'd like to introduce you to Mr. Gregor Umek. He's the Deputy Director of the Water Directorate of the Ministry of Natural Resources and Spatial Planning of Slovenia, and he will uh, provide our keynote speech. So I'd like to invite Gregor to come up here. Well, uh, thank you for the floor, Sir Moderator, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, esteemed colleagues. Uh, I'm really honored to be here with such uh, notable people at the round table here at this session. Um, well, it's been a while since science and after politics reached consensus that the world is facing water crisis. But how can we define water crisis? Is it too much of it, uh, not enough of it, or not appropriate quality? Uh, water crisis, together with climate and biodiversity crisis form a complex and interconnected uh, environmental challenge uh, so far never recorded before. Since water is also a um, limiting factor for sustainable development, ecosystem protection, climate change adaptation, it is in the center of this complex challenge. Just three weeks ago, we witnessed really devastating floods in Slovenia, which is really another painful local proof that global scale is changing and we have to adapt to new circumstances. On the other hand, there is a huge gap between <coughs> water availability, supply and demand. Why? Well, because the world's population is increasing and our development demands for water are rising rapidly. Although the latest SDGs report, special edition for 2023, brings some good news regarding SDG 6 implementation, we are still lagging behind in some crucial parts of it. Uh, this delay could worsen stability in affected regions like access to safe drinking water, sanitation, and hygiene. Water stress and water scarcity remain a concern in many countries. Wetland ecosystems and species are under critical stress and they are disappearing. So much more effort should be dedicated to to transboundary water cooperation and to development of international agreements. So how can today's session on contemporary water diplomacy help improving global water process? Maybe by sharing few good practices that our Ministry of Natural Resources and Spatial Planning is actively engaging to accelerate the implementation of SDG 6. Based on bilateral and multilateral agreements, we have a well-developed tradition of transboundary water cooperation. We develop it on all levels, uh, bilateral with neighboring countries, sub-regional in the frame of International Sava River Basin, regional in the frame of International Commission Co Commission for Protection of Danube River and Barcelona Convention and International in the Frame of Water Convention. But besides those agreement-based activities, we are actively engaged in developing and applying techniques, methods and approaches linked also to UN Water Conference 2023 Game Changers and our Water Action Agenda commitments. Maybe for the conclusion, mention just few of those. One part is integration of water and climate policy at national and international level by development of early warning systems like SAVA flood forecasting and warning system and also well-known Southeast Europe 
Drought Management Center. There is also integration of planning tools to source to see management approach. But last and not least, we are supporting uh, innovative techniques to data gathering and analysis, like the microsatellite-based twin models to support river basin management. Well, excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, esteemed colleagues, to conclude, allow me to invite you to the 23rd COP to the Barcelona Convention, which we are hosting in Porto Roche this December, and also to 10th MOP to the Water Convention in October next year. We are really looking forward to further combine water expertise and diplomatic skills in our common effort to contribute to peace and stability in this region and also in other regions. So thank you really for your attention and I wish you really a fruitful panel session. Thank you very much, Gregor. Uh, I apologize to everybody that I have to read this out. I had a choice. I could learn the biographies of the speakers off by heart, or I could enjoy the views of the lake. I'm sorry, but the lake won. So uh, the first uh, speaker on the panel today is uh, Simon uh, Gimson. Simon is Interpeace's Vice President and Chief Operating Officer, and he has been since October 2018 and he's also currently serving as the acting president. His career has focused on multilateral diplomacy and peace building. Uh, Simon has been the International Crisis Group's vice president and chief operating officer, following appointments as the chief of staff and then political director at the Commonwealth Secretariat. Earlier on, before that, Simon was a New Zealand diplomat with postings in Papua New Guinea and France and as a permanent representative to UNESCO, and also in London in the Queen's private office. He began his career managing aid programs in, in Pacific small island states. So Simon, I'm just looking around here, <laughs> Simon, Simon, a question to you. How, in your opinion, can we develop contextualized interventions that comprehensively address all of the underlying causes and the triggers, including water scarcity, of potential conflicts. Well, thank you, Richard. I mean, that, that read rather like an obituary, um, but uh, <laughs> but anyhow, um, it's lovely. It's lovely to be here, and uh, and having just come from the uh, the main hall this morning, where there was some pretty gloomy conversation about the migration of people from the region out of the Balkans the equivalent of two Slovenias of population, four million have moved um, from the region in, in recent years because of conflict. Um, I hope we can inject some optimism here this morning because I think the first thing in discussing uh, global water diplomacy uh, is, you know, I'd like to see this as a, a glass half full, not half empty. Um, if you look at, uh, at what's been going on in recent years and of course um, um, President Turk and his own um, kind and successful efforts in recent years with the Global High Level Panel, but also the very fact that we had the Water Conference, the UN Water Conference earlier this year, the first one we've had in almost 50 years. You know, the ground is shifting. Um, there is diplomacy going on, and it's good. Uh, and the international community is getting, if somewhat glacially, a grip on the matter. Uh, the fact that this forum itself last year also discussed this, this issue. The linkage with climate is another important uh, evolution and development. It's very important that we're not seeing so many of these issues in, uh, in, uh, in silos. And then, of course, the general public awareness. That also is a very important contributor. So whether it's the devastating um, floods that we've had in this country in recent times or the, the downpour that we experienced yesterday. Um, my suit is still drying out from the occasion. Um, the Kakova Dam, um, moving away from Europe to my own home region, the Pacific, a country like Kiribati, which is not only dealing with the climate consequences of rising sea level, but because they are atolls in Kiribati, the water lens, the very delicate water lens is shrinking, and so fresh water becomes less and less available. So there's a, there's a growing public awareness from the bottom up. There's 
growing international engagement from the top down. But your, your big question is how. And I think that what we do in the peace building world, if you like, uh, I, I, my voc vocation is, is SDG 16, not 6. But I think there are lessons from 16, from peace building, that can be applied in the way in which we tackle the water diplomacy challenges and the water challenges. There are answers to how we do this. Uh, and let's not get caught up on the word peace building. Uh, think of it more as social cohesion. That's, that's the essence of this. What are we doing to foster social cohesion in tackling water management, uh, especially as the gap between availability uh, and need increases? And if you look at this from a peace building point of view, one is, of course, you need to be profoundly context specific. Um, you can't develop um, answers for the context specificity if you're just trying to apply a universal approach. So you've got to be context specific. Secondly, you've got to be inclusive. Um, too many of these processes are elite driven. They're not sufficiently taking account of the marginalized, the vulnerable. Uh, and thirdly, uh, they tend to be fairly dogmatic in their approaches, and we need to be much more adaptive, much more um, looking at the actors who change over time uh, and be able to, uh, to adapt. And then fourthly is the accountability. What are the feedback loops to make sure that whatever your solutions are, that they're being fed back to those who are trying to improve? Now, um, a second lesson uh, from the peace building community is that conflict sensitivity has become a very sort of passive box ticking exercise. And what we've found is a more successful uh, way of looking at this is to be peace responsive, is to be more forward looking. What are you building in to your water management approaches that deliberately contribute to a better, more socially cohesive outcome? And you can deal with that through the systemic approaches. You can deal with that in the different institutions where you're working. You can deal with it in a very programmatic way. Um, and you can deal with it through the individuals who you have tasked to, to, to work in these different spaces. A good example is the work we did with the FAO in, uh, in Somalia. So they were looking at uh, rehabilitating uh, irrigation channels. Uh, and they went and they did their conflict sensitivity and they concluded that, yes, we need to put this channel here, we need to rehabilitate that one. But they weren't looking at it through a sort of a social cohesion lens. And when they did, they discovered that the work they were going to do was going to be conflict enhancing. It was going to deal with the water issue, but it was going to exacerbate conflict. And that takes me to uh, my final point, because I know we're on the clock, and that is money. And money does matter. Money talks. And um, arguably, there's enough of it. It's just the way it's being spent or not being spent. So uh, a fun fact for you. Uh, from our collaboration with the CGIAR, um, who uh, looked earlier this year at 22 multilateral institutions that are investing in climate. And they looked at the 28 billion that is being invested in climate, including water-based issues. Less than 20% of that, 28 billion, less than 20% is being spent on fragile, conflict-affected countries, the ones that need it most, and less than 20%. Of that 20%, less than 4% has had any conflict sensitivity done on it. 181 million of 28 billion has got any sort of conflict sensitivity around it. So when you're dealing with water management, let alone the broader climate considerations, most of the money we're spending is at risk, if not actually adding to conflict and undermining social cohesion. This is the area we need to address if we're going to address the how of, uh, of water management. Thank you very Thanks. much, Simon. Uh, I had an opportunity to observe the uh, actions of the FAO in Somalia earlier this year, and I would agree with you very much. And I certainly agree with your, 
your point about social cohesion. I think that that is absolutely essential. Thank you for that. The next speaker on the panel is uh, Johan Schier. Uh, Johan uh, is a senior associate fellow at the Stockholm International Peace Research Institute uh, with a focus on the Middle East, climate and security. He has a background in humanitarian affairs, development and environment, and has worked in different capacities for the Swedish government, the Red Cross, the Red Crescent Movement, and World Resources Institute, among others. Johan, my question for you, and it's a pleasure to see you uh, live. We, we know each, we've known each other online, and of course, since COVID, a lot of us have been surprised to discover that a lot of our interlocutors actually have legs. So it's a pleasure to meet you, Johan. Uh, how do we establish, Johan, in your opinion, how do we establish the right entry points for water diplomacy to help establish trust and cooperation, which is leading on a little bit from what Simon was saying, thus preventing conflicts? Johan. Thank you, uh, Richard. There we are. Yes, so thank you, Richard, uh, and uh, great to be here. And uh, to be here today, I think, uh, uh, give special meaning to this session a uh, few weeks after uh, the very uh, serious events that have taken place in, in uh, Slovenia, uh, a sort of somber background to the conversation we are having today. So great to be here. Um, I, I'd like to qualify uh, uh, the question a little bit and perhaps uh, problematize it somewhat. Uh, we are talking about uh, we, how do we find the, uh, the proper entry points and to, to build trust? And there are a couple of issues, I think. First of all, uh, we need to uh, acknowledge that there is not an abundance of trust around uh, today. This is not a very common uh, good. Uh, those of us who listened to the panel on multilateralism uh, yesterday, I think uh, that was a sort of case in point the creation, the expansion of BRICS, uh, 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 Chinese representative talking about this as a, a inclusive multilateralism, the Indian representative not representing the government uh, talking about this as plurilateralism. Uh, clearly, uh, the, 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 the um, sort of rules-based order, uh, the, uh, the uh, problems with the Security Council, the use of vetoes and so on and so forth, the, the observation that many in the world are doing the, the, of, of common standards that are being practiced by uh, industrial countries and so on. There is not an abundance of trust. And I think we all know that trust is something that takes time to build. And it's very quickly erased once uh, a fault is made, uh, a wrong step is taken. So let's be a bit uh, sh sh humble uh, uh, you know, in front of the concept of trust. Uh, the other question to ask when we uh, say, how do we find entry points? So who are we? Who is it that is looking for entry points? Uh, are we uh, European uh, government representatives, perhaps looking at what is now unfolding within Europe, where we have an, uh, a number of, of good and strong uh, basin agreements, uh, transboundary agreements, but where the impact of climate change is sort of changing the foundation of all of that. We have a much greater variability of stream flows, uh, agreements that were perhaps, uh, perhaps uh, most of all uh, intended to protect against pollution of, of shared waterways now have to contend with, uh, contend with uh, much more uh, variability of, of stream flows. So the issue of sharing of water, I, th I think, again, is uh, something that is emerging in, in uh, Europe. But we have the institutions. Uh, the European Union ha has the framework to address these issues. Uh, the, the f a fundamental trust exists within the UN from which we can uh, build and address these issues. There are also tensions in Europe, we know that, but we have a framework that we can use. So that's one thing, if, if we are talking about that. If we are somehow involved in the intractable uh, water conflicts, that's quite a different matter. Uh, as you probably know, today uh, or yesterday, the uh, governments of Ethiopia, Egypt, and Sudan are meeting in Cairo. Uh, 
without external uh, uh, facilitators, without the African Union, without the UN, without the World Bank. They have uh, uh, preferred not to have any kind of, of external influence in solving these issues. Uh, last week, the, the foreign minister of Turkey visited Baghdad and Iraq. And of course, we have the perennial uh, decades-long issue of the sharing of uh, waters from the Euphrates and, and Tigris. And we heard that the two uh, repeating things that we have ha heard for a long time, the concern from Iraq about the, uh, the, the big hydropower projects in, in Turkey that influences downstream countries, whereas the uh, Turkish foreign minister talked about Iraq not using efficient irrigation systems and could use the water they have in a much more efficient way. So clearly, we do not have the entry point, I think, uh, to engage in that conflict. I think uh, we, uh, history tells us that. If we look at the, uh, the outbreak of violence between Iran and Afghanistan earlier this year on the, uh, about the use of the Helmand River, mm. Who has the entry point uh, with Iran and Afghanistan to address this? Let's be very humble. We don't have that. We don't have that entry point. Um, and we are often, uh, when we look at these, these conflicts, where we are looking at uh, very uh, um, strong sort of power imbalances. We have, we're talking about uh, 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 repairing hegemons uh, with their strong influence, and we have uh, <coughs> other actors, other partners who have a very little leverage on, on the hegemon. So be, let's be humble again when we, when we uh, think about who, who is the we that is going to engage in these kinds of, of conflicts. So what I think we need to do is to have a better understanding of the underlying political tensions that sometimes precipitate as water conflicts that are not caused by uh, differences around water sharing, but are caused by much deeper uh, differences and, and, and mm. imbalances and, and asymmetries. Um, it, it's an interesting example to look at uh, the history of, of Syria and, and, and Turkey in terms of use of the Euphrates, where we have had times during the 80s and 90s when, when Syria had leveraged because of its support to PKK in Turkey. And agreements were reached. There was a detente uh, that included uh, Syria staying away from, from that support, which also led then to a, a, a bigger understanding and agreement on the use of the Euphrates. Mm. So we have an underlying conflict, uh, which then uh, leads to uh, tension over, over water. So we have to have a better understanding of what lies under all of this. Uh, and I think th this tells us not to pursue a narrow water diplomacy course. Mm. We have to engage in something which is much broader. There's a recent book uh, authored by uh, Mark Zaytun and others about water conflicts that uh, introduces the, the, the concept of, of conflict transformation. And transformation here means to transform the narrative, to transform the perception of conflict and also to tr transform uh, who is engaged, who is supported to engage in the conflict uh, in order to address underlying causes of, of what precipitates into water conflict. So um, I would conclude on, on saying that let's build on trust where it exists and address uh, new and uh, problems that are now emerging related to water. Uh, and let's be much more broader and humble in our outlook when we approach uh, uh, water crisis and, and tension over transboundary mm. water. Thank you. Thank you very much, Johan. Um, extremely interesting points and extremely important points, the creation of trust and this question of understanding the wider picture uh, between uh, regions and between nations. Uh, and uh, may I just say that uh, there's a very good article on water diplomacy that's been written by Johan in the Bled uh, Strategic Forum uh, Gazette, I believe the name is the newspaper. And uh, I would advise anyone who hasn't had a chance to read that to read that because it's, it gives a lot of insight into what Johan's just said. So thank you for that, Johan. The next speaker. Uh, I'm sorry if I'm looking around a little bit because I, we met about five minutes before the thing. Christian. <laughs> Christian. 
Christian Bretto. Christian Bretto is an associate professor uh, in water governance at the Institute for Environmental Sciences and at the Department of Geography and Environment at the University of Geneva. He's the scientific director of the Geneva Water Hub, a center of competence on water and peace, and he co-leads the UNESCO chair on hydropolitics. His work focuses on environmental policy and governance in general with a particular focus on water challenges. He also specializes on topics related to multi-level governance, to transboundary water management, and to challenges linked to intersectorality. So welcome, Christian. And my question for you is, how, in your opinion, do we influence entrenched narratives that hinder trust, which again leads on very well from what Johan was talking about, and cooperation? Uh, can science help? This is a, an essential question, for, for example, for myself. I'm the head of politics of a scientific institution in Catalonia. So can science help with regards to this? And what kind of social innovation is required? Thanks. Thanks, Richard. And I'm um, really glad to see that already my intervention will be really well aligned with what you said and what you said in the first two uh, interventions. So there is already some coherence within the panel, which is a good news. Uh, thanks for the moderation. Thank you uh, to the Bled Strategic Forum for the, for the invitation. It's nice to see water in such an arena uh, for several years now. And to go back to your question uh, on the narratives and entrenched narratives, I, I would first start by recalling that actually those narratives even once crystallized through uh, political decisions, uh, are never are far from being uniform, actually. Uh, and this is particularly true when it comes down to water management and transboundary water management in particular. Uh, those entrenched narratives are actually the result of a, of a series of arbitration. And uh, as Johan said, also a, a result of power relations that take place uh, internally between actors uh, and coalition of actors that are looking for specific uh, objectives and that can intervene at different <laughs> levels not only nationally, but also across the, the institutional uh, spectrum. This being said, uh, transboundary water arrangements also reflect a very realist world. And uh, I join again, Johan, about the fact that we need to be humble uh, on that, uh, where we have water that goes along with very strong uh, national sentiments, uh, with sometime, which sometimes strikes at the identity uh, of a state or, or, for, or people. So therefore, I believe that really unpacking those entrenched narratives, uh, the way we see things, is, is critical. And I believe that a better understanding of trust and water cooperation calls also for a better understanding on how those existing narratives uh, get crystallized, how they are, they are structured, how they have been structured, and how they did, did they get institutionalized through a political positioning that will shape the transboundary interactions uh, at the end of the day. And such analytical process uh, contributes certainly to get a better sense on, of how those arbitrations have been operated and at what elements led to a specific political decisions. So again, unpacking the water box, going beyond the water box itself. So in short, I argue that this strong analyt analytical focus on, on narratives can contribute to a better understanding of the key variables that actually structure the interactions uh, among the different parties. And this understanding is the way to open up, possibly, new ways forward, to identify what are the key triggers for possibly moving towards reinforced trust and, and cooperation. Maybe let me give you a, an example. At the, the Geneva Water Hub, and, and Johan, you mentioned uh, Mark Zitu, in particular my colleague Mark, uh, we, we currently work uh, on, the, on the Yarmouk River, so this shared river between Israel, Jordan, and, and Syria. And so what we did there is that we work with an interdisciplinary perspective, uh, trying first to unpack the situation, which is already quite complex, and also to unpack the entrenched narrative that are out there, and that exists both in Syria and Jordan in particular. And so on the one hand, with social sciences, to go back to your question of the contribution of science. Mm. Uh, with social science perspective, we, we show a strong official Jordanian uh, narrative, which held that Syria built more dams than the 87 agreement. And then on the other hand, the remote sensing work showed that actually there were no more dams than the agreement showed, and that the volume of water held back uh, by these dams were dramatically less 
than generally thought in journal. So this was a way to debunk a little bit the narrative that was like hindering the negotiation between the parties, you know? And once we did that, we could focus our attention on how to shift the narrative within the policymakers and also to, to define in a different way the root cause of the problem. And here it was, in that case, the, the agreement itself. So this is a rather, let's say, virtuous example. And, uh, and we also know that, unfortunately, uh, we also know what politics is. And we also know that it's not only about rationality. And sometimes, even though you have all the data in the world, you're not able to make the situation progress. And I, I know that because I, I work uh, currently on the Rhone River, which is shared between Switzerland and France. And we did a baseline analysis and the diagnosis of the situation in 2015, and nothing moved so far. So you have other, also other factors that come into play, uh, that's for certain. However, to, to go back to your question, I still believe that science can help, and also maybe related to the first example I gave. And it can help in, in different ways. And I, I will maybe structure <coughs> my thought in three possible entry points. First of all, if you look at the literature, you will find many uh, different analytical tools that contribute to first unpack the narratives and the evolution. So looking at the broad picture, what is the trajectory for which reason the narrative moved along the way? And what was, was the ter determining factor for this to move? Uh, right before the session, we were talking about flooding as a, you know, as a, those type of critical events that can shift totally the political situation. What led to this change? Then there are also tools that allow us to understand how the building of coalitions work. What are the actors? Why did they decide to get together to support specific narrative at one point? Uh, what was the objective? Then you also have to, to explore uh, existing core values that structure a political decision policy process. And those values are keys, because when you talk about water, uh, and we're talking about hegemony, the sense of nationalism uh, that sometimes is there, uh, values are a key entry point to try to shape a little bit the process in a different way. Um, and then finally, to understand how such narrative structure institution, but also how they depend from previous internal setup of power relations. So it's, it's kind of an egg and chicken story there. Then the second point, uh, in regard of narrative structuration, and not to be in the perspective of trust and cooperation, uh, evidently, and there's like many examples out there, the technical or scientific dimension helps to structure dialogue. And we saw that with track two diplomacy processes, where obviously the entry point through scientific or technical matters is, is, is more easy uh, to, to, to start with. The third point um, is the contribution of science and academia more generally on capacity building. And I think here there's also an opportunity to try to change or to add different layers to ongoing narratives uh, by helping or sending messages to the actors in a different way. And for instance, at the Geneva Water, we decided to use core values such as international law, multilateralism, human rights, mm -hmm. in order to structure the education program that we did. So this is a way really to, create, to, to help actors to grasp complexity, but also to, to see that water management and governance goes also beyond particular and, and national interests. So in brief, maybe to conclude, uh, to go back to your question, indeed, science can help in many ways. Uh, we should be humble, but it can help, that's, that's for certain. Notably by unpacking existing narratives and the development, by identifying possible entry points for trust building and cooperation, by building capacities to us towards the grasping of the full complexity of, of water management, and finally, and maybe last, as, a, as a final input, by facilitating dialogue. And here I really strongly believe that science can be a relevant mm -hmm. broker uh, also to bridge actors, narratives, and also different levels of analysis, you know, not only national, but from national to, to, to local. Mm. And this is where maybe social innovation can take place. Uh, sometimes you, you all have, or only have one narrative which is considered as, you know, anchored in the marble, but actually, once you get those different narratives taking place at different levels interact, you might also see the evolution move a little bit. And we saw that, for instance, in the Mekong region, uh, in Laos in particular, where you had this narrative of the Mekong as the battery of Southeast Asia, but then the perspective at the local level is really different. The issue is that, that actually those narratives never meet. So you need to find and facilitate processes for those narratives to exchange and to make the whole situation evolve. Thank you.
Thank you very much, uh, Christiane. You've made some very important points as well, um, which do nicely lead on from what other speakers have already said. Um, I think that one of the most important things that you said is, um, okay, who are the parties that should be involved? And you mentioned right at the end uh, the question of communication, for example, between supranational, national and subnational uh, levels down to the local level. And I think that that's extremely important if we're talking about citizen engagement uh, and if we're talking about, for example, Simon uh, was talking, uh, mentioned the marginalized groups that are often affected by a lack of action. And surely we are coming to a point now where we should be engaging what we describe in political terms as the quintuple helix at a local level. So the public sector, the private sector, the scientific and academic sector, together with culture and together with the citizens themselves. Mm -hmm. Uh, so thank you for those in very important points. We come on to the next speaker of the panel, who is uh, Suzanne. Suzanne, welcome. Uh, we're not being very gender-wise on this panel, and I do apologize for that. But Suzanne, you are, you ha you are extremely welcome. And uh, Dr. Suzanne Schmeyer is an associate professor of water law and diplomacy and the head of the water governance department at IHE Delft in the Netherlands. Her work focuses on the legal institutional mechanisms for preventing and solving conflicts over natural resources and the environment. She's a member of several water and climate related expert groups, advising governments and international organizations, including being the lead for international waters at the Global Environmental Facilities Scientific and Technical Advisory Panel. She has previously worked for various national and international organizations, such as the German government and the World Bank. Suzanne, you're very, very welcome. And my question to you is the following. What best pro uh, practices exist to mitigate uh, risks, such as water nationalism, and to promote opportunities for transboundary water cooperation in a transparent and equitable manner, which would again be addressing the question, I presume, of trust? Suzanne, welcome. Thanks. Thanks a lot, um, Richard. I'll start on a positive note, but no worries. I'll get away from that quickly. Um, historically, we've actually seen very little conflict over <coughs> water. So if you look back, if we look at the research that exists, we see that the vast majority of interactions between states has not been conflictive in nature. However, and I think that's an interesting observation, there's also not a lot of cooperation over water. In fact, what what mostly happens when states interact over water is something that happens in what Kant would have called the negative peace. It's not conflict, but it's, so it's an absence of conflict, but it's also not really cooperation. And I think that is a problem because we need cooperation over water resources that just by nature happen to be transboundary in order to address all the problems we have, be it the lack of drinking water, with still 2.2 billion people suffering from the lack of access to, to safe drinking water. We needed to address flood management issues. Um, we needed to address the fact that 40% of the world's population already now live in areas of water scarcity. We needed to address uh, wetland degradation, for example, where we've lost more than a third of the world's wetlands in the last 30 years. So we have this situation where so far there hasn't been a lot of conflict, but there has also not been enough cooperation. And if we combine the fact that there's just this absence of conflict with broader developments, climate change, of course, but also what I would argue and what I've heard a lot here at the conference, um, including yesterday at the multilateralism panel, which I think was really great, um, the, the decline of the multilateral order, the, the decay of international rules, the fact that countries are turning towards nationalism, towards unilateralism, to to keep their own legitimacy for governments, to please their constituencies, whatever the, the reasons might be. I think that combination is leading to a situation in which we're most likely seeing more competition and more conflict over water resources. And I would say here, and that might be, for some of you, maybe a very water-centric perspective. I apologize for that. I'm a water person. Um, I think if we start not believing and not implementing international rules that the community of states, but also basin states individually, have established, mm. that is a sign for me, that's kind of a, a canary in the coal mine of an overall declining multilateral order. If we don't cooperate or if we don't even comply with rules over something as vital as water anymore, we do have a problem. 
turning a little bit more positive again, I think there is something that, that we can, can do about that. And I think there are many points, many have been mentioned by my, my previous speakers here, but I would like to highlight three benefits, institutions, and information. I think benefits, we need to reconsider how we assess costs and benefits. We've so far focused a lot on the costs of conflict, often not really seeing though the indirect costs of conflict, such as declining diplomatic relations, um, cut trade ties or, or uh, supply change, loss in diplomatic relations, and so on. But um, that is only a part of it. I think what we've not really been looking at, what I think is crucial, is the costs of non-cooperation or the foregone benefits that we're missing out on, that people who depend on water are missing out on because there's not cooperation. And this can be things such as um, flood forecasting systems, obviously something very important. To give you an example, in the Elbe River Basin, which is my home basin, we've seen that the floods in 2002 and in 2013 have been more or less the same in magnitude, but because of a transboundary flood forecasting system between Germany and the Czech Republic that was established in, in between the two floods, the loss in lives and assets was significantly reduced. But this is something that we would otherwise be missing if there wasn't cooperation. Or if we look at the Senegal, where countries were able, the Senegal River, not the country, uh, where countries have been able to, to develop dams together that they would not have been able to fund individually. These are all the benefits that, that we're missing out on and that do push, that not seeing these benefits does push countries into internationalism. So considering these benefits differently, and I think science has a, to come back to what Christian said, science has a key role here in identifying them. I think secondly, we need to, to work and continue working on institutions. We're doing quite well in the water sector on that. In terms of the pure quantity, the more than 600 treaties over shared basins and more than 120 basin organizations, so like mini UNs for, for specific basins. But we've seen a decline, a reduction in the establishment of such institutions. And that's not because all the basins have one by now, but because there are basins that still remain without or basins where institutions have been established but never really took off, like in the Lake Kivu Basin where a basin organization has been established but in 2014, but until now no member country has actually ever paid their membership fees. Or we've actually, even in the Senegal, usually a, a positive example, seen that Guinea just a few weeks ago suspended its membership in the OMBS, in the Senegal organization, explicitly stating there's not enough benefits coming out for us. So I think we need to continue working on these institutions. Yes, criticizing them, but a world without them would be even worse. So my third point, kind of related to that, would be data and information. Um, water is, is subject to fake news as anything in the world, and maybe even more so because of the complexity. It's difficult for a lot of people to understand the scientific, the technical complexities in water, which is why I think we need to improve science, but we also, very importantly, need to improve the water literacy, I would maybe call it, of policymakers, but also of, of the media. Not easy in times of echo chambers and so on, but that would be my, my sort of three points to, that we have to work on. And I think if we, the water people, but also that's why it's great to be here at this conference with, with all the other security, um, international relations and so on community, if we do that together, I think we can actually turn the entire thing around and use water as an entry point for cooperation, not only over water, but as we here within the Sava mm -hmm. Basin here. Here is the prime example where cooperation over water has actually led to cooperation over many more things. So I think that's maybe a way to kind of resuscitate the, the cannery that's, <laughs> that's dying. And I think it's, it's, it's also really time to do that, and to do that even if we're unhappy, if we're frustrated, um, if we're um, not very motivated given the state of our institution, the state of water cooperation, because just to conclude, if I might completely twist that, that old quote from, from Doug Hammarskjöld, water cooperation and environmental cooperation hasn't been made to take humankind to heaven, but to keep us from hell. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Thank you very much, Susan, and that very, very, very well put, if I may say so. Um, it is true that we are living, unfortunately, in a time when populism has never been so dangerous. 
Geçmiş. Developed over the, the, the past decade, uh, facilitating their prediction. How do we make sure that those are put to good use in preventing the conflicts? And I would extend that question and say, are they of any use whatsoever? Thank you very much. And uh, I just want to thank Slovenia and the Black Forum for this opportunity. Um, it's innovative and it shows the way, I think, in terms of what needs to be done. Uh, you asked me whether those tools are useful, and I will start by saying they all relate to a keyword, foresight. But how we use foresight is something that needs to be really defined properly. We need to have political foresight, we need to have social foresight, and we need to have the technical foresight, which is related to what you asked me here. And let me just start with an anecdote. Uh, I was the head of uh, resource development for CGR back in 2020, and coming from the fragile conflict uh, world, working for the CGR, I was working with scientists that deal with food. And I immediately saw that these people were working on something extremely important for the political and the security community. And I almost lost my job because I pushed for having a big discussion in Geneva and then Interpeace was the first one to welcome us to have a discussion about how food scientists could work with peace people. And you just mentioned one of the results. But there was a lot of reluctance two years ago. Climate change and security is a buzzword today. It was not exactly a buzzword three years ago. And that's something that we have to remember because we're basically building on the go. We're catching up and we're way behind. That's one element. So just that as an example of what we need to do at the moment. Do we have the foresight to do these things? Let's start with the first foresight on the political element. Do we have the appropriate governance? Do we have the appropriate mechanisms? No, we don't. It doesn't respond. It's making some progress. Slovenia, thank you very much. You're going to be there in the Security Council. Other countries have also lead the way. Let's see how that moves. But um, the entire software that we have to deal with conflicts is not adapted to climate change as such. And so we need to develop new tools and even reconsider how we define conflicts. And for that, we have to, it's a famous phrase that we use all the time, we have to think outside the box. That's extremely important. Um, the second element is how that foresight translates into political mechanism. I'm a public servant. I brief people that brief people that brief ministers. And sometimes uh, we see that what is being captured as knowledge here end up being something else up there. That loss, we call it loss of uh, uh, transactional costs, if we can call it that way, is problematic because we don't have the time for normal processes at the moment. So in terms of political foresight, we really need to change things. In terms of social foresight, it relates to the social cohesion you're referring. And let me just plug it here. We have another panel. We're going to be talking about that in the afternoon, about the social contract and how we need to change things. Uh, because social cohesion, given the situation in which we are now, which we are giving up on the 1.5 and moving on to the 2 point something, that's probably going to be the only workable tool that we're going to have in the middle to worst case scenarios. It's how we're going to work with each other, live with each other, and don't kill each other 
for the fact that we haven't been able to manage better. So social cohesion and the ability of humans to work with humans is what's going to make us go through if we ever have a chance. That's one element. Then when we go to the technical uh, foresight, again, let's think outside the box. Why? Because I am coming from the school of political scientists, and we work on diplomacy and all these things. And what we do is important, and I think it has shown a lot of results. But the interdisciplinarity that emerges from talking to people from different fields give us ideas that probably were not necessarily aware at the moment. Um, one thing that amazed me is that in the 21st century, uh, we do have a lot of data and information, but we don't necessarily have awareness of that information sometimes. Mm. And that, that's problematic because, for instance, uh, tools and practices that are happening in one place or in one conflict are not necessarily being copy-pasted or transposed to other situations. The stuff that people are doing in Europe in terms of water governance is great. And then how can that be transposed onto the Amazon basin? Or how can we just manage situations in Europe that could be applicable to the water situation between Canada and the United States? Let's just remember, in that case, in my, my particular country, we have a major governance system that takes care of water with the United States. But that situation, we see how that's going to evolve. So in terms of technical tools, um, there has been, very recently, uh, a lot of work on the use of complexity science in conflict analysis, conflict management, forecasts, different areas. And where is this complexity science coming? It's actually from economic complexity. It's how the European Union uh, invests money for economic development is using a new way of approaching data. Well, that's economic complexity. What does have to do with water or conflicts or climate change? A lot. Because there are tools there that are showing us that if we really manage data in a different way, we might have insights that give you the entry points, that gives you the tools that allow you to work on a different way, the, the tools that will help you frame a different negotiation. Right? Um, there's been a lot of reluctance to take on these tools. Change always takes time, but that's something that we don't have at this point. So when we talk about that foresight, do we have the capacity at this point to really uh, use these tools and, and do the analysis? There has to be a lot of uh, inside work, a lot of institutional work. Because if you go back now to the Security Council and you present the science, as you said, the, well communicated or not, but you present the science, there are countries in the Security Council that are, will refuse to accept that as, as evidence. And that is problematic. Mm -hmm. So how can we do that in a way that they actually accept it? Or how can we frame the presentation in a way that makes it acceptable to them is a different thing. Another thing that we have to um, remember is that when we talk about water diplomacy as one field, uh, first of all, I applaud the work that's done in this field because it's far ahead of what's happening in other areas where we have to deal with climate change and conflict. Can we use that knowledge, that know-how, that governance, because it comes down to that governance, and, you, and transpose it into other areas? Or can we just redefine the field in a way in which it's not just siloed, like water, food, air, biodiversity, but we just create a context in which we say, you know, we have a major problem with the biosphere where we live, and that is basically threatened because of the current situation. Let's learn and let's use from the practices from where we are. That's, that's an issue that is still a challenge. One lesson I got from working in conflict areas in fragile situations is that governance or the ability of humans to work with each other is a very precious capital. It takes too long, too long to develop it, and it takes nothing to destroy it. And so if we have developed this major work in water diplomacy, man, this is the golden kit. And let's use it, let's multiply it, and let's promote it. And so for that, thank you, Slovenia. You're showing the way. Thank you very much, uh, Diego. Uh, again, I find myself agreeing. It becomes actually quite boring when I find myself agreeing with all the panelists. But who knows? But, <laughs> but um, I do agree with you. Buzzwords do come and they do go.
I mean, buzzword is something very important and essential one year, and the next year is completely forgotten because there's something politically more sexy on the agenda. So we have to be careful about buzzwords. And I think it's absolutely essential, I think, as you were saying, that we need to be able to have the capacity to convert foresight into action, data into effect. And the only way you can do that, in my opinion, is by involving not only the whole of society, the whole of what we call the quintuples helix, but also, for example, we talk a lot about the WEFE Nexus Plus H, the connection between water, energy, food, ecosystems, and public health. And the people who resist that cooperation most are the different sectors of water, energy, food, ecosystems, and health. So we have a very basic problem there right from the beginning, but I think it was important how you highlighted that. Finally, we come to the last speaker of, of the panel, uh, but by no means the least. Uh, Danilo Torque, I hope I've pronounced the name correctly, is the former president of Slovenia. Uh, he's had an illustrious career, um, including legislative work and advocacy for many issues, including, for example, human rights, the right to development, the prevention of discrimination, the protection of minorities. Uh, he was working for, I believe, 13 years at the United Nations, where he had as well an illustrious career before returning to Slovenia, where after two years in Slovenia, in 2007, he was elected as the third president of the Republic. Um, he is now uh, a leading member, or indeed the chairman of the, of the Club de Madrid, I believe, and he is also an emeritus professor of law at the university in Ljubljana. It's my pleasure to welcome Danilo Tusk here and to ask Danilo a question. And my question for you is the following. The political economy of conflict over water is changing the power over controlling water and how it's, it's dispersing. It's affecting the balance of power within basins. How can water diplomacy uh, take advantage of this development? Or can it? Uh, thank you very much, Richard. And uh, well, let me start by saying that you have offered a uh, point of departure in your conclusion before introducing me, hmm. uh, when you said that, uh, uh, obviously, the need to uh, define the right definition of a particular nexus in a particular situation and to move beyond this scientifically ascertainable um, foresight into something that is a political agreement on the issue. That, that's really critical. And that's where diplomacy comes in. But diplomacy is not an independent activity. Diplomacy is really an expression of political will. Uh, and of course, diplomacy also is not a mon uh, monolithic concept or monolithic phenomenon. It's, uh, it's quite diverse and involves a very wide variety of issues, very wi wide variety of techniques, and all this is changing. So when you're asking about diplomacy, you do not ask a specifically procedurally defined activity, but really a wide variety. And let me quote, uh, let me recall something that Madeleine Albright, former Secretary of State of the United States, said to young diplomats. He said, I know that you are all starting your studies with the aim of being the next Bismarck, or at least Henry Kissinger. But in fact, you are going to be much more relevant and much more helpful if you specialize and you deal with a variety of issues from humanitarian development and other things. And then, of course, that would lead you to very different areas of work, and you will have to be much more sensitive to the scientific and expert knowledge which exists in those areas. So that was the basic message. And I think that that's quite important. Uh, what she did not explain was that, in fact, all this the effectiveness of this um, activity, the variety of activities, depends on political leadership. Because it's political leaders that actually help making a scientific consensus an effective tool. And very often, which we discovered in many places, including in Slovenia internally, uh, there is no consensus among scientists. And it, there is a need for policy makers 
to figure out what is the wisest course to take. One shouldn't expect that you just, you know, put, put together an expert committee and then everything will follow from there. There is no automaticity in this, in this, uh, in this area. And of course, we have to be um, uh, aware of what uh, uh, we heard from Simon earlier on. The ground is shifting. Uh, social cohesion is always a problem, and these are political issues which only political leaders can address. And then obviously there are big issues at the level of global politics, and I'd like to mention one example which I think illustrates the problem of diplomacy quite well, and that is the question of the River Nile, which was, I think, also mentioned early, earlier in the panel. You see, um, I was chairing a panel on water and peace uh, years ago, from 2015 to 2017, and in that context, uh, there was a meeting of the Security Council of the UN organized in 2016 by Senegal, which was at that time presiding the Security Council. And Senegal has a great experience with water cooperation on Senegal River, practically uh, actually one of the most sophisticated mechanisms that exist today. So we had a debate, uh, many member states came, around 70, 72 member states came, and they were very constructive. And of course, Egypt and Ethiopia also came at the level of ministers, and they spoke. And obviously, uh, Egypt spoke about uh, an important legal principle, do no uh, significant harm in transboundary water cooperation. While Ethiopia understandably spoke about a rational use of water resources. So each of them chose a particular aspect of the UN Water Convention on Transboundary Non Navigational Uses of Water and put it in the center of the discussion. Now, the, of course, there was a disagreement, and that disagreement continued. That disagreement luckily did not lead to armed conflict. And that's not automatic, because we know that years earlier, there was a lot of talk of the possible armed intervention of Egypt vis-a-vis -vis Ethiopia. But times have changed, the balance of power has changed, many things have changed. So the uh, emergence of an armed conflict is not likely. However, at the level of political discussion, at the level of, of diplomacy, and of course at the level of construction of the great Renaissance Dam, the problem remained. And everybody wanted to be a broker. So, there was a moment when that was in, uh, the Security Council debate took place in 2016. Subsequently, there were initiatives by the Russians. You know, President Putin invited the parties to, to, to Sochi, uh, the Americans. President Trump wanted to be a broker. And when he failed, he kind of became very angry and uh, asked the, the, the World Bank not to agree on certain loans to Ethiopia and so forth. So there was a lot of this classical political stuff happening. And, uh, and then, at, at one point in 2021, Egypt brought this specific issue of the Nile to the Security Council. And the Council had a discussion very wisely. It decided that the Council cannot do very much. That was a wise, diplomatic, how should I say, orientation. Because uh, re realistically, they discovered that, well, there was no entry point, as you would say, for the Security Council. And of course, the way out was not difficult to find. African solutions to African problems. And then the whole thing was put to the African Union. President Ramaphosa started the process with a certain degree of enthusiasm and then discovered that African Union as union is also not going to succeed in a short while. And then, of course, the next president was President um, Macky Sall of Senegal, who you know, has very good legitimacy to do you know, diplomatic initiatives but they, too, did not do very much. Um, the Senegalese also did not uh, venture into any major uh, mediation as, uh, initiative. And as we have heard uh, right now, the countries that are directly involved are again talking about this. And we'll see what that brings. Now, what I want to conclude on, on the basis of that very dramatic, very important experience is let us not take water diplomacy as something either clearly defined in terms of procedures and institutions or in terms of outcomes. Water diplomacy is a much more open-ended matter and has to be involved in a variety of things in a variety of ways. 
Uh, now, earlier on, uh, Christian spoke about different levels that have to be brought into the picture. Mm -hmm. And that, of course, is very important. Now, um, I assume that uh, when, you, when, you, when you deal with the, when you try to understand the issue of the water issue of Iraq, of course, one has to look into all levels of Iraqi structures to, to really understand the problem and, and find a way to solutions. But on the other hand, one also has to understand the critical importance of bilateral issues. Now, uh, Iraq and Syria came close to a war about uh, Euphrates back in 1975. This is a long time gone and not going to happen again. But uh, Iraq and Turkey will continue to be in a very sensitive process of bilateral politics, so to speak. And that will go to the highest levels. That will go to the highest levels in both countries. <clears throat> and again, one has to understand, Turkey, of course, as the upper riparian country, will have very serious reasons to maintain its particularly important position. And that's not going to change. Mm. Turkey, on, in addition, will have its own problems of water, which one also has to understand. Turkey is upper riparian, but it also has water problems as a result of agriculture, salination of land, and all that. So it's not going to be easy to figure out what the entry point for international actors could or should be, and uh, what would actually help. There is no shortage of actors, uh, international actors involved, uh, from the UN system to, to various, uh, various organizations, including Geneva Water Hub, where I I'm happy to continue to work with. Uh, and of course, one could ask a question. All right, so the international system is becoming quite complex. Uh, and that's my final question. At what point would um, an active role of the UN Secretary General become relevant? Uh, because you know, at, at certain moments, there is a need to, to talk directly to heads of state or government and lower level international officials and uh, NGOs and others will not be able to do the job. But there can be a job for the highest echelons of international organizations, including the UN Secretary General. Now, there is no automaticity in this matter. There is always a need for very careful analysis of uh, all factors and then deciding on what to do. What I would like to say, well, let's not close any, any, any option for the future, and let us then work with this complex and quite diverse system patiently. My final thought is, you know, patience is a very important thing aspect of international water diplomacy, patience in developing rules, patience in developing institutions, patience in building scientific consensus, patience in handling all these different levels of communication. No, that's my last word, patience. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Anainu. Um, <coughs> allow me to be provocative. Mm -hmm. uh, we've, we've listened to all of the panelists. I think that a lot of what has been said is very much in agreement with each other and very much compliments. However, I'm, you have left me with some doubts. So allow me to, to provoke a general discussion and please just come in, argue with each other um, in a diplomatic manner, obviously. Um, but l allow me to suggest a couple of things. Are we coming to a point where perhaps national diplomats should be taken out of water diplomacy? Should the national aspect be taken out of water diplomacy, or indeed any other type of diplomacy? The reason why I ask is, for example, uh, many years ago I was engaged in the creation of the Covenant of Mayors. Not the Covenant of Prime Ministers, not the Covenant of Presidents, the Covenant of Mayors with regards to energy, uh, with regards to the creation of a, of a, a program which was employed by the European Commission in order to try and achieve what was then originally the 2020 idea of reducing, um, reducing uh, the use of energy, of increasing energy efficiency, and also increasing um, the production of renewable energies. And what worked, and what became so successful, and what involved a vast number of citizens around Europe and then eventually around the world as it became the, as the, as it became the global um, covenant of mayors was the fact that we were working through municipalities. We were not working through nation states. 
I myself have had an experience of, shall we say, water diplomacy between Israel, Jordan, and Palestine. And the way that I have done that is by working through Jerusalem, Tel Aviv, Ramallah, Nablus, and Amman. So the national question has been eliminated. My question is, am I therefore worthy of the Nobel Prize because have I discovered the key to international water diplomacy by ignoring the nation states, or am I totally wrong? Over to you. Suzanne. I guess that's the advantage of being the only woman on the panel. Um, <laughs> I'm a gentleman. Uh, I'll use that, of course. Um, <laughs> I'll give you a very academic answer. It depends, but let me clarify a bit. Um, I think it really depends on the basins that we look at. Um, you've probably now heard the names of basins that were mentioned here were kind of always the same. When we talk about conflict, it's the Nile, it's the Aral Sea, it's the Helmand, it's the Hari Rud, it's the Euphrates Tigris, maybe to some extent also the Mekong, although definitely yeah. to, to a lesser degree. So I would say we can maybe look at basins in these concentric circles with some that do experience significant conflict that is also entangled with all sorts of non-water issues. and that's I would say that's the ones where we do need the diplomats, the ministries of foreign affairs and so on. But then I think there are other cycles or circles around it um, where sort of maybe in the next layer there is occasionally diplomats that need to come in, but then there is this vast amount of basins. I mean, there are, more than, there are 313 transboundary basins now and more than 300 aquifers transboundary. And I've mentioned five now where we have conflict, but there are all these others around where cooperation is working is functioning, not perfectly, again referring back to what I said, said earlier, don't make the, the perfect the enemy of the good, but where cooperation is functioning and where we actually would want to see a situation where we avoid securitization or politicization, which typically happens if you bring the diplomats in. So I think the question is here, how do you strike the balance and how much can you maybe use other means like you mentioned the mayors, it can also be scientific communities, we've seen in the Amazon, um, a network of researchers bringing together the countries that then led immediately to the negotiation of an agreement over um, the Guarani Aquifer, which is kind of the aquifer that largely underlies the, the Amazon basin more or less. So I think here for me it would really be the, the differentiation. So diplomats, yes, but at a limited dose. Okay. All right. Um, yes, Diego. Yes, as a diplomat and <laughs> somebody who, it's a, uh, I, I'm known to rock the boat a bit too much. Okay, but at the same time, uh, I believe in the boat. And uh, taking your question, I would say it's not that we shouldn't have diplomats; is that the national interest has to be redefined in a way that responds to the situation. Because what we have in most of the times when we're dealing with diplomacy is we have these zero-sum games. The national interest, what the minister is going to say, what are we going to gain. Still, zero-sum game.
Johan. the local, the national, and the international community to engage. develop the projects that would help stabilizing that particular part of the, of the wider region. Now, water happens to be a very important part of development in that region, but water in that specific circumstance requires very good understanding of local traditions, local, local actors, local everything. And is the UN capable of addressing this issue adequately? Uh, now, in Geneva Water Hub, we have a program on this subject, and we are conducting a number of consultations. And as an optimist, I believe that as a result of all these different interactions, we'll be able to develop meaningful, let's say, as recommendations or meaningful advice to what needs to be done. And part of that, the UN system, through its various agencies, can do. Now, uh, that uh, answers your question. I mean, of course, uh, national diplomats are not going to be critical in that regard. One would need a much wider variety of experts and much wider variety of actors. And the most difficult part, in my opinion, is how does one establish the necessary trust and meaningful international role with local people? Correct. And here, here is where we started our discussion yeah. in this panel. That's one of the critical things. And since water diplomacy is such a diverse area and such broad area, this is perhaps one of the priorities we have to have to look at. I, I do agree completely, and, and hence my my defence, shall we say, of being able to reach the local level. And indeed, the United Nations, the World Bank, the OECD, amongst many other organisations, have been calling out for that, especially over the last five or six years. Christian. No, maybe to follow up, indeed, I think we should pay attention to examples where those bottom-up dynamics allow concrete policy changes. Because, indeed, people do not always wait for the governmental diplomats to act and to change the situation. And I think there's also a need to go in different ways as the old way nowadays. And we see that in different places of the world, actors tend to try to find new ways of organizing themselves. And there's one concept which is coming up at the moment, which is a legal personhood of rivers, which is really strong, where you see that we try simply to find a, a new way to shake up the governance structures and to find new narratives to, to work together in some ways. 
And those in certain regions led to massive policy change in only a couple of years. Uh, I mean, you know certainly the region, but the Mar Minor in Barcelona, it's a popular mm -hmm. initiative that led to use policy, policy reforms, granting a water body with uh, the legal personhood, and also organize a whole governance structure around it. So it it's, has its own challenges, that's for sure. But I think those type of examples are interesting to try to, to see what is the positioning of states in that story and how they can also benefit from different type of dynamics, maybe less formalized and maybe more uh, bottom up. Simon? Thank you. Well, thanks, Richard. I, I think you deliberately floated that balloon for us all to then have a shot at it. And, and I, think, uh, I think we all have in our own ways that uh, diplomacy matters. Um, it's the first line of offence, it's the first line of defence, uh, whether it's at a national, international or sub-regional level. And it's the civil path. It's the civil path to peace. It's the civil path to, to resolution of differences. And when we talk about the water context where this gap is widening between availability um, and, uh, and need uh, and the conflicts that can potentially arise, if we're not following the civil path to peace, then uh, the alternatives are the sorts of paths that we've seen that have led to misery, um, the over-kinetic uh, approaches that we've seen in the Sahel that mm. President Turk has just alluded to, mm. are precisely the wrong way to go. Uh, and so uh, I think you know, we began on a note of optimism, and I think we can continue to be on an optimistic note that uh, global water diplomacy has accelerated dramatically in the last decade or so. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, if you compare it to the, the previous four or five decades, and it's going in the right direction, particularly in the way in which uh, more and more uh, we're looking at the context specificity uh, and the way in which the voices of the voiceless, the inclusivity is becoming more hardwired into it and the science is becoming a more useful tool for, for fostering those conversations that are so important. So, yes, I, I think you'd be disappointed if I didn't um, take a pot shot at your balloon. I am delighted to say that my provocative balloon is now shot and is lying in tatters on the floor of the conference hill. So now that we've achieved that, let me open up to the audience and if any of you have a question, please raise your hand. I'm being told one question, so you're going to have to raise your hand really quickly. Uh, and then uh, a young lady will come with you, to you uh, with a microphone. So does one person have a question? Yes. And it's not because we have the same hairstyle. It's just because you were the first per It was because you were the first person to raise your hand. Thank you very much. It's not because our hairstyle, but because we have a common interest. Uh, although we don't know each other. My name is Andras Sörenyi, I'm from Geneva Cities Hub, which is an organization in Geneva promoting the participation of cities and local governments in multilateralism. And actually we talked about SDG 6 and SDG 16, and in the middle you have SDG 11, Sustainable Cities. So I would like to provoke you for a round of question, continuing uh, that line of local authorities, because water crisis uh, is more and more important in cities. Do you think that the multilateral institutions can help to prevent, to foresight a better future in cities where water shortage will definitely create crisis? Thank you. Okay, I don't know who wants to answer that. Yes, Diego. A quick one and then. Um, cities is where humanity is gonna be for the rest of the century and <laughs> the centuries after. Uh, it's interesting that there's a lot of knowledge about cities because we've been living in cities for most of our existence that we're actually picking up now. Like a knowledge of how to manage heat is coming back into the cities because we realize that we're building cities in North America and Western Europe that are not adapted to the climate change that we're going to be facing. So yeah, cities have a lot to do this. Uh, cities are at the same time the place where we have those interactions among different groups is where you have the hubs of ideas. It's important to ensure that that, that brewing mechanism gets to have a voice. Um, there was this mentioning of the city diplomacy. Um, we need to have a different way of conceiving how we ensure that that has a voice at the international level. 
You cannot get mayors to figure out ways to talk to other mayors on the side or through the city elements. Let's remember, before the creation of the, of the United Nations, ILO was created, okay? And there's an interesting mechanism there. Some people use it, some people use it as a, as a way of considering things. In the ILO, you just don't have the state. You have employers and you have employees. You have a, a tripart. Why don't we try to pick and use some of those elements there and create international representation or diplomatic frameworks at the UN at every level using that kind of tri tri mechanism. So you have city representatives and you have civil society and they all together can provide a more complete vision because the exchange will be a little bit more substantial. Would anybody else like to comment? Suzanne? I would just like to briefly add um, really to your question. Um, the, the multilateral system, international organizations, states, diplomats might not be the ones that ultimately save the cities, but without them and without their engagement, I think the cities are doomed. Anybody else? In that case, for the first time in my life, I'm actually going to finish a conference on time. This is a historical moment. Um, um, I've still got three minutes, though. So I would like to first of all thank Johan very much, Suzanne, uh, Diego, Simon, Christian, and Danilo for participating in this panel. I thank you very much as well for your uh, keynote speech, which was very interesting and got the ball rolling. I'd like to thank very much uh, the Slovenian government for inviting me here to, to have the pleasure of moderating this very interesting panel. And uh, I would like to wish you all a very uh, good, interesting and successful what remains of the Bled Strategic Forum. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you.